hier horen spreken we over de details, de mensen van uh, Sunday. Um, <coughs> yes, uh, and uh, just uh, you know the choruses and everything like that as well. Uh, and uh, reminded me when I came to the Lord in Sejuna. Uh, yeah, at the end of 1957, and we had meetings there for about a year then day. who came from Geelong, he was our pastor there. And uh, um, we started having choruses, and uh, very short on for chorus leaders. In fact, desperate. I was the chorus leader, and uh, <clears throat> I find it very hard to sing in tune. Uh, but um, we, we didn't have any music, and uh, we went by, and... Uh, the whole year we were singing these choruses there, and I came across here, and I found out they were singing all the choruses out of tune over here. It wasn't the way I taught them at all. So uh, anyway, praise the Lord for that. And then later on, <coughs> I moved to, uh, well, I'd already left home at that stage, and uh, settled in Port Lincoln, and uh, Janet, um, who became my wife, she was already over there. She'd come across to help, because she, uh, uh, was a teacher and she could teach the kids in Sunday school and also uh, Noel Hales, um, Jill's auntie, had uh, got her started on the piano accordion uh, which we called an agony box but uh, anyway she was, uh, she, was, she was learning that and uh, when first came to Port Lincoln there uh, we had a new chorus each week. She set herself to, t to learn a new chorus each week and she chose all the choruses of course. So. Anyway, it was all, all very interesting, all good. The other thing that I was reminded of during the testimony, so much of Pastor Chad, very similar story. Um, he uh, uh, was a young fella um, <coughs> doing all those horrible things uh, that happened there and uh, he went to uh, a nightclub and uh, he, he, he was so bad, so badly behaved in the nightclub, he got turfed out. And um, I love telling this story because the nightclub was called Heaven. So Chad is now a pastor, and we've got a pastor who was kicked out of Heaven. So uh, anyway, and uh, and then he, he uh, put up with his younger brother for, for four years, um, who uh, gave him a really hard time, uh, pestered him and annoyed him and so on. Uh, but he withstood the barrage, and eventually Phil came to the Lord, and he's also a pastor now. So. Uh, and uh, I don't think they ever let Phil into heaven in the first place. But anyway, praise the Lord. So anyway, we better have a look at a, a scripture or two. And I was not sure what I should preach about, but I um, um, I was rung while I was here from a brother at uh, Woodcroft. Some of you would know him, Brendan Gloyne. He's one of our uh, officers there, and he organises a. Um, once a fortnight at Woodcroft they have a, a morning session on a Thursday uh, where they um, have a particular subject and they get they get older pastors and they even let me do it uh, to come down and to, and to do something and he's, he's very helpful he, he, he organizes the subject and um, which uh, sometimes I find that's the hardest thing is trying to work, make up my mind what to talk about but Anyway, he's, he wants me to do something on the 4th of August. And so I thought, well, I'd try it out on you guys and see whether it's any good or not before I do it there. So anyway, um, so don't bother going to Woodcroft on the 4th of August if you don't like what I'm going to talk about. So the title of the talk was called Overseeing God's Church. I thought, yeah, he comes up with some good things. I thought, I reckon that's a pretty good subject. So I thought we'd have a go at that. Now... Uh, just a reference without having to taunt, talk to it. Um, when I looked up in the concordance, uh, <clears throat> well, actually somebody else's concordance, concordance. No, I had looked it up before I came away, but they got a nice one there, uh, the the, uh, the resort that I'm staying at. So uh, anyway, I looked it up, and uh, <clears throat> the word church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. They've got other things about their temples and all this sort of thing but there's a reference to it in Acts chapter 7 verse 38 when when uh, uh, Stephen is um, giving his last speech and um, he referred to God's church in the wilderness in the time of Moses 
And um, <coughs> the, uh, the Greek word, which the New Testament being Greek, is ecclesia, and it means a calling out. And so when you think about it, well, Israel was called out of slavery. And uh, <coughs> they were uh, being called to go to a better life. It took them 40 years to get there. They had to breathe the old guys out and bring the new lot in. But um, uh, so they were called out of slavery in Egypt. And uh, so they finished up in the, in the promised land. But their centre of worship was the tabernacle, as most of us are aware. And the tabernacle is, uh, is a type of Jesus Christ. I think a lot of you would know that. There's all sorts of um, things about the tabernacle the whole way through it. it. It starts off when they come in and then the sacrifice is made. And that's a type of Jesus Christ being uh, a sacrificed. Uh, they, they had a laver to wash, which is, of course, a... Uh, a type of our baptism, and uh, and then they they go into the, uh, the the holy place, and there's all sorts of things in there. There was the table of showbread and the candlesticks, which are all types of Jesus, and um, and then you um, you get into uh, um, <coughs> um, yes, so then then you get into into the holy of holies, and uh, there. Um, there's, um, there's other bits and pieces, but in particular, there is the Ark of the Covenant. And inside of this uh, is uh, several things, Aaron's rod that budded, there is the, uh, the, the um, uh, pot of uh, uh, the uh, manna, um, uh, reminiscing of uh, the time when they were in the wilderness and so on. And then there was the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. But over the top of this was what was called the mercy seat, and um, <clears throat> and then uh, that's where the, the blood was to be laid as well. And uh, this is extremely uh, significant because this is a type of uh, the blood of Jesus Christ being applied to God's God's mercy being applied to us, and the law is 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 overshadowed by the mercy seat, and over that is the glory of God being radiated and of course it just so wonderfully fits in with the New Testament story the doctrine and everything there of how that uh, you know we we come to the Lord Jesus we know that his blood was shed for us we know that he paid the price for our sin we know we have to get baptized and and eventually to receive the Holy Spirit and uh, we we realize that we, we were sinners and that uh, under the law we were condemned to, to die and the soul that sinneth it shall surely die, and we'd all sinned. And, but then we realise that God's mercy prevails over his judgment every time. Praise the Lord. And, uh, yeah. and uh, so this is, um, this is what we, uh, we, we understand and, and we, we get the full benefit of. But, of course, then over the top of all of this is the Holy Spirit, and that's what seals our salvation when we, we turn to the Lord. So the church... In the wilderness was a great example of the New Testament church. Now, we just go to uh, the book of uh, Exodus, if you could, for a moment, just to the right at the end of it, the last chapter, where the tabernacle was built. And, um, and then we read in verse 33, uh, that um, very last uh, chapter of Exodus, verse 33, and, uh, and Moses, talking up here, he read up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. And so Moses finished the work, which reminds us of Jesus under the new covenant when he died on the cross. He said, it is finished. And then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And so the, uh, the Holy Spirit came in and, and filled the place. And uh, that's, of course, what has happened to us when uh, we, we come in to, to the new covenant. Now, <clears throat> just to, to touch on a, a, a few other scriptures, we might have time to have a quick look at that. Um, in, in John chapter 1, where this is uh, pointed out to us, John's Gospel chapter 1. Oh, where did I leave that? John chapter 1. Here we go. <clears throat> John the Baptist, verse 26. He said, I baptise with water, but there stands one among you whom you know not. 
He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I'm not worthy to unloose, talking of Jesus, of course. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptising. And the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And he said, This is he of whom I said after me is, uh, comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Well, Jesus was the word made flesh, of course. And I knew him not, but that he should but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptising with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptise with water, the same said unto me, Upon you shall see the... Him. Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptises with the Holy Ghost. Wonderful little passage that sums up Jesus, Son of God, the, the Lamb of God, and the baptiser in the Holy Ghost. So, rightio, now let's uh, get on to this business about what this church is like. Let's go to the book of Acts. Not a bad place, is it? Book of Acts, and we'll go to chapter 2. And uh, we'll go right to the end of chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, <coughs> and here's another reference uh, to the church of the Lord. Um, and um, we might uh, read in verse 46 of Acts 2, and they, the, all the disciples, who, all the people who just come to the Lord, continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And now for the first time, we read about people belonging to the church. Up until that time, there wasn't any church in the way that the Lord wanted it to be because he hadn't poured out the Holy Spirit until this time. And so <clears throat> this is where the Lord added to this church. And so... I think uh, we're preaching to the converted pretty much here, but we know what the church is made off, up of. And it's, in case you've forgotten, since you last opened your Bible, the uh, beginning of the church was in chapter 2 and, uh, and in verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, and uh, there was a the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Um, and down in verse 4, <coughs> excuse me, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so then Peter, um, there was a huge crowd of people gathered, as we, I think most of us are fully aware, and uh, what's going on here? And uh, Peter stood up and proclaimed that this is what God said would happen. It had been prophesied in the Old Testament a number of places. And uh, so this was, was God uh, proving that he'd raised his son from the dead. And um, he said in verse 32, this Jesus that you killed, God raised up, and we're his witnesses. And uh, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And down in verse uh, 36, therefore let all the house know uh, of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, they said, what shall we do? And he said, you repent and be baptised, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, so it's promised to you and all, even the many, are far off, even in Australia, that God would call. And he's promised that. And with many other words, I always liked this. He was obviously a long-winded preacher, which is excuses some of us for trying to beat him. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward or this crooked generation. Well, if they said it about theirs, we could certainly say it about ours as well. But we've got to save ourselves from us. So then they that gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day were added about 3,000 souls, which is not a bad day's work, is it? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, and, uh, <clears throat> and then that's where we come to what we read to before, that God added to the church uh, such as should be saved. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's the church that he added to. 
And that's, that's the real church. And uh, it, it just amazes me how the longer you go on talking about the Lord and trying to talk to other people and all the other stories that you hear and all this sort of thing, and they all want to turn you to verses here and there and says, oh, you know, if you believe, you're going to be saved and somewhere else, uh, you know, all sorts of things that they quote. But they don't seem to want to get down to exactly what was happening in this church. And it wasn't a church until the Holy Spirit was poured out. And, uh, and, and that's the true church to this day. And, but, but people got all sorts of names. They, they, there's, there's a church called the Church of Christ. But it isn't. The Spirit's not there. You get the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and you get the, the Reformed Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the, and the Revised Reform, and whatever, it goes on. And everybody's got it, the Catholic Church and, and all this. But they can call themselves what they like, but it's what God calls them that it, it, it really matters. And so that is the true church. And that's our goal. Whenever I'm talking to people... Um, I, I just love to say, oh, what church do you long, what sort of church is it? Well, you know, I used to say oh, we're a Pentecostal church, but I don't like using that term anymore because it might have started on the day of Pentecost, but they've made such a mess of the reputation of it and it's just associated with all sorts of fanatical things and compromise. A lot of them called Pentecostal and there's hardly anyone spirit-filled there. But, uh, but that is the, the, the true church. That's what we aim to be a part of. Okay, so we, we, we're wanting to talk about the, the overseeing of, uh, of this church. Let's go to chapter 19, just in case anybody was thinking that, well, that was the day of Pentecost, but what about after that? Well, this is some time after that. You go to chapter 19, and uh, here we... <clears throat> We've got a chappy coming on the scene who wasn't there on the day of Pentecost. This was the Apostle Paul. He'd, um, he'd had, he, he, went, he was totally opposed. He went around killing Christians and trying to wipe them out. But God uh, had other ideas for him. And <clears throat> we know the story. Stopped him on the way to Damascus and uh, blinded him. And he came in and got healed and filled with the Spirit. And uh, then... We read in uh, Acts chapter 19 uh, that he, he came, um, <clears throat> came to pass, there's one, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, and we have not so much as heard with the beaming Holy Ghost. And he said, under what then were you baptised? And they said, under John's baptism. Then said Paul, John fairly baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. It's a pretty long talk, isn't it? <laughs> Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse or different were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from and separated the disciples. That's what an ecclesia means. It means they're separated. He went into, if you like, he went into this church. No, it wasn't a church. He went into the, the synagogues and these places where the Jews used to gather and, uh, and, and got them, turned to the Lord, get baptised and filled with the Spirit and then dragged them out, separate them out. And um, that's, uh, you know, a lot of us got into trouble from our relatives and friends uh, when we, <coughs> we left a church. I don't know how many of you were churchgoers before I was. I was so serious about it. I was even contemplating uh, going into the Methodist ministry and I uh, remember uh, back in the, the days, <coughs> well, we got married here in 1960, and um, the, um, <coughs> the day uh, afterwards we went to a meeting down in Morwell, and I remember giving my testimony there, and different people were saying how they'd, they'd uh, been delivered from this, that, and the other thing. And, um, and I said, well, God saved me from becoming a Methodist minister, and that was quite a, a, an escape. Anyway, so praise the Lord. But, um, yeah, anyway, don't know how I got onto all that. 
But um, so there we go. These, yeah, that's right about being separated. And uh, <coughs> yes, oh, I nearly diverted into talking about a separator that you used to put the milk through to get the cream out. But that's another story. Um, and so, um, and so they continued uh, by the space of two years, and, and, and all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, uh, both Jews and Greeks. And so <coughs> here's uh, this outpouring of the Spirit here, and it, 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 it went right throughout the region uh, as a result of this. <coughs> and uh, remember, this is at Ephesus. And if you go over to chapter 20, we find there um, <coughs> that Paul was travelling around. This is considerable time later. And in verse 17 of chapter 20, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So he sent a telegram or carry a pigeon or, or um, somebody uh, to go and get them to come and see him. He must have been uh, just on a whistle-stop tour, I suppose. And uh, so they came to see him and uh, <coughs> he's telling them all about his adventures. And, um, <coughs> and <coughs> we can take it down to... Um, uh, verse 25, he says, And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And that's a pretty important point, that um, churches like to take the bits out of the Bible which they like, which suits their cause. And I used to think that. I used to think that, well, I'm a Methodist, but we got certain parts of the Bible that we like, and I think, well, we get the bits we like out of it, and someone else uh, gets the bits they like, like a Lucky Dip. Do they still have Lucky Dips that you used to go to the show and you'd pay your sixpence? A lot of you wouldn't even remember what a sixpence was. And, uh, and, and then you can have a Lucky Dip and, and so on, so... They each dipped in the, and got something out of the Bible. But lo and behold, we see where the Lord says, we, we, it's not supposed to be split up into bits and pieces. He's supposed to get, it's all or nothing. And we want it all. We're greedy. That's what God wants us to be. Have the, everything that you can from him. Um, he said, uh, I haven't shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And this is where we start to get to the direction uh, for so the overseers of the church, church. these were the elders that gathered there. Uh, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. And I think this is an extremely important point. If you're going to be a good leader, you've got to set a good example. And, uh, you know, for those uh, <clears throat> who've ever had anything to do with uh, military service, uh, there are certain leaders that have become famous because the troops had every confidence in them because they would lead the charge. And uh, they didn't have the same confidence in people who sat back in the office and sent them off to die at the front. And so uh, our, our leader, as uh, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's led the charge for sure. And uh, he made the supreme sacrifice and he is saying to, uh, to, to the overseers of his church, we'll read about that, we we'll read the whole verse perhaps, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock and over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, there's a lot in that verse, and uh, maybe it's all I needed to turn to, but I like to talk a lot. And so <clears throat> it says here that it's his church, and, um, and these people had been chosen by the Lord to, uh, to oversee it and to make sure that it's run the way that he wants it run. It's his church. It's got to be done his way. And, uh, you know, sometimes people get the idea that the church is their possession. Well, <clears throat> you know, we don't, we don't belong to any man. We belong to, the, belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but he says, first of all, if you're going to be a good overseer, you've got to get your own walk in the Lord right. And... Uh, and, and you've got and people have got to be able to see that you're leading by example, that you uh, and say, oh look, that's that's not my job. I think we had a prime minister who he lost his job because he said that's not my job, and it certainly isn't anymore now. But anyway, uh, but uh, if 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 that's the way we as leaders think, oh look, that, you know, that's too hard. I, 
You don't go ringing me up if you're dying in the middle of the night. Well, you know, wait till the morning before you, you, you get that sick or whatever. I'm a nine to five job and so on. Well, it doesn't work that way. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Get your own act together. Because it's not much good telling other people how to live their life if your own isn't in order. It's like uh, if you're a heavy smoker and you tell your, your kids not to smoke or a heavy drinker and all these things. And um, not many learn from the mistakes of their parents. I did. My brother and I, even though he never ever came to the Lord, we never took up smoking. Well, I gave it up when I left school, actually. And uh, when, when I was allowed to, well, I didn't want I didn't like it all that much. I could tell you a story about how I made myself ill with it. But anyway, um, but um, so Dad used to smoke. And he always got into trouble with Mum because he kept burning holes in his shirt pocket with it from his pipe. He'd put it in there and hadn't put it out properly, you see. But anyway, no, that's... Uh, so, <clears throat> anyway, as a pastor, I, I've never had to set a bad example about smoking. And um, so... Uh, or drinking alcohol. And, um, you know, well, that's... People want to argue about alcohol. Isn't it all right to have a little bit? Well, Romans 14 says... Paul said, I wouldn't drink any alcohol. It might be a bad example. It might cause someone else to stumble. In fact, I think I might have touched on it the other day where it talks about being sober. That means not to drink alcohol at all. And, and so, look, w when I went to boarding school, it was a church school, and the padre uh, that uh, came there, he, uh, he used to smoke. And then, then they'd try and tell us that we shouldn't. Well, that wasn't a good example, was it? Anyway, so praise the Lord. So, but here we, we're talking about not just what we don't do, but what we, when we are overseers, need to, to lead a good example, make sure our own walk is in good shape, and take, take heed unto ourselves and to all the flock. Look after our own walk and watch out for the welfare of the others, because the Holy Ghost has appointed to this position. And sometimes we've said to people who, you know, taken on a role of some um, responsibility in the fellowship and uh, they might have been glad to take it on and then you have to remind them sometimes, remember, God has put you in this position and you need to make sure that you're doing it. And sometimes people bow out because they find out that they, they're not really suited for it and that's understood and so on. But it's God's church and he says, it's my church because I paid for it. And then he paid for it with his own blood. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> who can argue with that? Okay, so we better press on a bit, haven't we? Um, yeah, so that's uh, that one. Oh, we read a little bit more. For this I know, that after my departing, Paul says, shall grievous wolves enter in among the flock, and uh, among you not sparing the flock. And um, I can tell you a little story about, not so much a wolf, but a dingo. It's an Australian version of a, of a wolf, perhaps. And uh, we had um, a lot of sheep on our farm. And there was one dingo that got through a hole in the dog fence and caused havoc in the district. Hundreds of sheep were either killed or maimed by this one animal. And uh, <clears throat> it really caused a lot of trouble. And I still remember going out there to where the sheep were and... They'd, they'd charge the fence when they, they just panicked and charged the boundary fence and they were out in the scrub and it took us days trying to round them up and you found them that had been bitten by this, this one animal. And, uh, well, um, fortunately there was an indigenous tracker who, uh, who earned his keep. He tracked him down and the, the dingo got his comeuppance. And uh, so uh, that was... Uh, uh, we were all very relieved to hear that. And so when it talks about wolves and it says that, you know, sometimes there are wolves that come in and get stuck into God's people. And uh, it's our job to, um, to, uh, to protect people from, uh, from, uh, <coughs> from wolves or, or people that, that are playing, behaving like wolves. And he says, uh, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There are people who want to have disciples. They're supposed to be uh, shepherds of God's flock, but they want the people to be their disciples. 
and they masquerade as getting them to follow Jesus, but the, the people are actually following them. And God said, that's not on. That's not the sort of shepherds I want. I want shepherds who look after my sheep and uh, for me, so because I'm going to provide an eternal home for them. We can't provide them an eternal home because we're not here, uh, but, but the Lord can. He said, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with, with, the, with tears. So he said, I've been warning you, watch out for all these things. Okay, a few other things I want to talk about. Um, just uh, yeah, about leading from example. If we go First Timothy and chapter 4. Now Timothy, um, <coughs> he was referred to, <coughs> I think, in one place as a bishop. Um, a bishop is also another name for a, a, a overseer that sometimes uses interchangeable words. But he was a, a young man. Um, 1 Timothy 4, verse uh, 12, let no man despise thy youth. Well, <coughs> um, I used to read this verse. It doesn't seem to apply anymore. Uh, my, uh, uh, <coughs> but my dad... Uh, didn't think much of my attempts to convert him. I don't know whether I was very wise the way I went about it. Uh, his saying was, who do you think you are preaching to me? Well, uh, I didn't say I was the son of God. I think that he wouldn't have understood that. We had one brother who did do that. He was at a country show down Mount Gambia way and there was uh, the Minister of Local Government or someone had, had, had opened the show and, and this brother, they had a stand there and he, he started witnessing to him this guy said do you know who I am and he said no he said I'm the minister of local government and so this brother said do you know who I am and no he said I'm a son of God and uh, yeah, the, the minister didn't want to talk to him anyway so praise the Lord let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word know the word of God that's that's what if we're going to be an oversight We've got, to know, we've got to know what's in the instruction book. And so he goes on to say, in conversation, in the things which we talk about, you know, the whole of our conversation, whether it's edifying, in charity, in showing love, in spirit, we've got to be spirit-filled, in faith and in purity. We've got to be exemplary example as much as we possibly can. And he says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and to doctrine. In actual fact, this passage really illuminated for me when I was very young in the Lord, and I really felt that God was telling me to put aside my worldly ambitions and get out and preach the gospel. So I left the farm after being only spirit-filled for a year to convert the world, but boy, it's a big job. And uh, I haven't, I've still got a long way to go and running out of time. But anyway, so that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, and they're just setting out that these are the sort of examples that we expect of, uh, of our leaders. Till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation and to doctrine. Make sure you got it right and uh, keep away from, um, from, you know, extreme things. And so the simple gospel is all we need. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, the, which is given thee by prophecy by the laying hands on the, on the hands of the of the presbytery. In other words, the elders of the church prayed for him and he received the Spirit. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting uh, may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So you've got a personal reason to be a good example if you want to uh, maintain your own salvation. So anyway, I'm not talking to a whole lot of uh, leaders here, but just I think it's important for us to understand that that's what God expects of leaders. And um, anyway, just a couple more things. They're talking about them being shepherds. Now, there's a great little verse in the book of Isaiah, if I can find it. It's back here somewhere. Um, Isaiah chapter 40. There we go. Verse 11. And it talks about the Lord. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are young. 
are, are with young, talking about the mothers, the ewes. And, um, <coughs> yes, so the Lord feeds his flock like a shepherd. He looks after, you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down the green pastures and beside the still waters and so on. And uh, so that's our Lord. And he shall gather the lambs, the little ones, the babes in Christ, and uh, uh, with his arm. He picks them up in his arm if they need to be carried. And he carried them in his bosom. He looks after them like they were little babies and shall gently lead those that are with young. He'll gently lead the mothers because what happens, those of you who know anything about sheep and lambs and so on, they, they, uh, they get rolling around together in their, their, their kindergarten and uh, then when they're disturbed, well, the first thing the mothers do, they're calling out for their, their little ones and so on and uh, they don't want to go until uh, they, they've sorted out the right ones. They know who's is their own and so on. So the, 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 the shepherd uh, will, will knows this and he, he knows not to drive the, the mother sheep too hard because the, the little ones will suffer from it. And all of these things, he understands his flock and uh, that's what we need. That's why uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy being a pastor. It's not always easy, but... Um, <clears throat> Well, there's, there's some wonderful people in our fellowship and uh, <clears throat> I've thoroughly enjoyed myself over here because I've met more wonderful people and uh, <clears throat> looking forward to coming back again when you've got twice as many as you've got now. Anyway, praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> okay, we'll go to the New Testament, Luke chapter 15. Um, I don't know what time I started or what time. I've been battling a bit with my voice, but... I think some of you are starting to pray that it conks out soon. But anyway, um, here we uh, here we go. Uh, when I say Luke chapter fifteen, <coughs> and <coughs> uh, <coughs> verse three, he spake this parable unto them, saying, "What man of you having a hundred sheep?" Apparently, it's mentioned several times. That was probably a fairly standard sort of size of a flock of sheep. Uh, one person is totally divide his life to looking after a hundred sheep, and um, it said he's, he's got a hundred sheep, and uh, one of them goes missing, and um, it, 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 doesn't he leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying unto them, "Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep." which was lost. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's what a shepherd will do. He, you know, somebody goes astray, he'll do everything he can to find that sheep and bring him back into the fold or her and, um, <clears throat> and so on. So that's, that's very important. But it's interesting that later in this, we won't go through it all now, but there's another parable that Jesus talked about, the prodigal son who, um, who, who uh, wanted his inheritance and he got his share and he went out and, and, and blew it all, wasted it all on riotous living and immorality and all sorts of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> his dad didn't go looking for him. And I think that that's something I think we, in, in leadership capacity, sometimes we have to decide, is the person who is not attending currently, uh, <clears throat> there may be other reasons, sickness, one thing or another, but... Are they a lost sheep who needs to be found and brought back gently into the fold again? Or are they a, a wasteful son, that's what a prodigal means, uh, that, um, that you're not going to get them back. You might try, uh, but they, they, they're just totally disinterested and sometimes you just have to leave people. And the, the, the problem is knowing which one they are sometimes. So the best thing is to try and treat them as if they're a lost sheep and, and try and bring them back. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> but if they don't want to know, say, so let me know. And <clears throat> even people, some years ago, 20-odd years ago, we, we had actually a, a pastor who uh, decided to leave us. And uh, I remember sitting down with him and saying, well, um, <clears throat> I don't agree with what you're doing. He'd been listening to people that were grizzling and and uh, he'd sympathised with them. He wouldn't tell us who it was. He said, you're the pastors you're supposed to find out. Hang on, I thought you were one of them as well. But anyway, he was going off 
And uh, I just sat down and talked to him and said, look, if you realise you've made a bad mistake, well, give us a call. And he told somebody afterwards, he said it was like a father-to-son talk and uh, he hasn't come back. But I did hear that he was a businessman and one of our, our brothers was doing some business with him. He said, have you ever had any regrets about leaving? He said, oh, only every day. I don't know why he hasn't rung up. But uh, anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, so that's that one. The, now, the Lord said to Peter, uh, John 21, he said it three times. He said, you know, do you love me? And uh, Peter said, yes, he did. He said three times, he said, well, first of all, he said, feed my lambs. I think that's significant. You feed the young ones in the Lord. Make sure you look after them. Peter, by the way, was called, first of all, he was called to be a fisherman and he finishes up being told to be a shepherd. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, and I think that's, you finish up the, the dual role. You have to catch the fish and uh, bring them in, uh, but then you need to treat them like you, you treat a sheep that needs to be nurtured and looked after. So anyway, so praise the Lord, we, uh, uh, yeah, somebody leaves, we, we want them to come back. Um, <clears throat> let's go to, uh, I've uh, written down here, First Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> There's a lots of things that we could talk about when we get to talking about sheep. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay, First Peter chapter 5. Um, I should put my specs away and then I'm going to find it again. Um, Paul writes here in verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So it's not, it's not all hard going. We've got a huge reward waiting for us at the end. And uh, all of us. And here he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Here we are again. It's God's flock, not ours. Feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now there's heaps and heaps of religious people who are only in it for the money. How many, I'm sure some of you have come across different ones. Oh, well, look, I would, uh, you know, I can see what you're saying. It would be nice to have the spirit. Some of them even get spirit filled. But they won't leave the church that they're in because they'd be out of a job. And uh, they don't really value their salvation, do they? It says here, we don't do it for filthy lucre. That's another name for money. But of a ready mind. This is what I want to do. People have said to me, I'd hate to have your job. I said, well, it's not, not vacant. And uh, not at the moment. Um, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock, that when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall be, receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Well, some of us are looking forward to having something else on our head, aren't we, brother? Yeah, so uh, we're going to have a crown of glory. You can mock us for our boldness and all this sort of stuff, but uh, you know, we're going to have a crown of glory. You're going to have one too, but you know, you're know, you used to having something on your head. So there we are. We're going to have a crown of glory because we're looking after the Lord's people. Okay. Uh, just, I only got one more verse, one more passage. Uh, let's go to First Corinthians and chapter one. First Corinthians one. Okay, verse ten. <clears throat> when the revival fellowship uh, was formed back uh, about twenty-eight years ago, we got together all the pastors and we decided that we'd write up a. Um, I suppose sort of like a constitution. It was really just stating how we do things and we all agreed on this and, and um, it, was, it, was, it was really good the way it all came together. We'd been running assemblies for years and we just wanted something in writing so that we could refer to it and we would, we would keep, uh, um, you know, as close as possible to the, doing the same thing everywhere. And, uh, and we <coughs> we'd put this verse in it. We didn't quote a lot of scripture. We we're just stating what... Uh, we do. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, 
and that there be no divisions among you, but that you should be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And our, our comment there was, let's not change anything unless we all agree to change. And so we've made some changes. There have been minor ones, but we've carefully talked about in the, re uh, the um, repercussions from change. And, and some, sometimes some people have wanted major change and, and we weren't prepared to do this and they've gone their own way. Well, may the Lord look after them. That's their problem now. But, but we, we said we, we want as much as we possibly can to stay united because if you're not, well, it causes a lot of grief to lots of people. It goes on to say, um, for it has been declared in verse 11 unto me, uh, uh, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, um, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you has, uh, uh, every, one of, every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. So you, you having all these arguments, well, who do you follow? Oh, I follow Paul. Oh, I follow Peter. I follow Apollos. And you say, hang on a minute. What's this all about? Is this Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? No. I thank God I baptised none of you, save Christus and Gaius, lest anyone should say, uh, I, uh, lest any should say I had been I had baptised in my own name, and I just baptised a couple of others. But he said I, I'm, I'm out there preaching the gospel, and others uh, have been doing the baptising. So, <clears throat> and I think you know what I'm sort of hinting at with all of this is that uh, uh, Christ isn't divided, and uh, he knew what he was doing. I'm. God knew exactly what he was doing when he filled me with the Holy Spirit and he knew what he was doing when he filled you with the Spirit as well. And so uh, as a result of that, that's the point we look back to. I mean, for me, 64 and a half years ago now, and some of you, anybody beat that record around here? Daryl. Hmm? Young Daryl. No, he can't beat that. He beat me at everything else, so, yeah, Okay. But anyway, praise the Lord. We're not into breaking records. But, um, um, <clears throat> but anyway, praise the Lord. I know that that was the turning point in my life. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it was Len Day who baptised me. He used to run a, uh, a shop in Moorabool Street, an auto electrician shop. And um, <clears throat> my wife Janet uh, had come to the Lord here and, and she used to go with... Uh, um, people like Len and Joan Day and Peter Mullen and different ones that went around to towns around about. And she was writing to a cousin who'd received over in, in, uh, <coughs> in Adelaide, in, uh, in Sejuna. And uh, she used to go to Len and Joan's place and have a cup with them. And uh, she was telling about all this. There was one or two other relatives received in the meantime. And uh, anyway, then um, uh, Len just said, well, why don't we have a campaign in Sejuna? Christmas time. Uh, so they did. That's where I came to the Lord. And so that was, uh, that was, you know, that was, that was great. But that night, when I received the Holy Spirit, Len was praying with me. He baptised me a few days later. But I never saw myself as a disciple of Len Day. I would have been a complete rat bag if I had been. But anyway, he was, <laughs> he was a character... Yes, he could be very annoying at times, but uh, he, he didn't always set an example that we should follow, but I'm eternally grateful for him to leading me, uh, to get me filled with the Spirit. But I'm not his disciple, I never was. And uh, so, <coughs> praise the Lord, we, uh, we are the Lord's disciples, but we have uh, shepherds that God has appointed. He's, he's, did I read that bit about the chief shepherd? Did I read that bit? No, I should have. Um, don't go away. Not, haven't been allowed to go yet. Oh, yeah, silly me. All these sorts of silly things. Neither being as lords over God's heritage, being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. So there are, there, there are uh, apprentice shepherds. There are, there are people 
who uh, are fulfilling the role. The chief shepherd shall appear. He's, he's coming back, the, the, the major overseer, the boss of the whole show. When he shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. He said that twice. We read about it before, didn't we? Partakers of the glory that shall be revealed. So don't let anybody tell you that they or anyone else belongs to some particular person or implies that that's where you've got to be if you want to get saved or stay saved. It's a load of rubbish, rubbish, garbage or any other word that you like to think of. The truth is we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who paid the price. He's the one that's coming back for us and uh, the shepherds are there to help us along the way and um, it's a great privilege to be one of them. All right, praise the Lord.